question today is, I thought I would add something about the Gospel of Judas since this is current in the news. And I got the title from a friend of mine, uh, work, Jumping the Shark, <laughs> from the newsroom to the ivory tower, assessing the Gospel of Judas frenzy. And what I mean by that is, hey, practically everybody, even in the scholarly community, you have people who are just sort of getting swept up in the media frenzy, at least scholars who are media noticed, people like Elaine Pagels and Bart Ehrman, uh, are just sort of exaggerating, not sort of, they are exaggerating, the whole Gospel of Judas thing. And in my estimation, they, they have jumped the shark. If you're not familiar with the term, I'll say a little bit, a little bit about it later. But let's just jump into what the Gospel of Judas is. If you've been on another planet over the last month or so, uh, this is for you. Of course, the Gospel of Judas is a Gnostic, Coptic document. The National Geographic Society uh, put together a team once this document was recovered. And frankly, it has a very shady lineage when it comes to how people got it, how the National Geographic Society got a hold of it, who had it before then, and how did they get it and pass it around. But it is another one of these Gnostic Gospels uh, that we're familiar with in other contexts, specifically Nag Hammadi. This is what the Gospel of Judas looked like as it was retrieved from the cardboard box in which it was kept. Uh, it, was, it actually was, was kept in cold storage for a while, uh, according to the story, which really damaged it. It caused deterioration of the ink, and somebody, one of, one of its owners thought that if you like froze it, it would help it, but uh, just didn't prove to be the case. So, <laughs> you know, you can see in this picture the ink leaching through from the other side and tattered there. About the project, in order to be certain of the age and its authenticity, the National Geographic Society again put it through a whole round of tests. If you go to the National Geographic Society website from which this is taken, you can view profiles of the contributors to the project, those guys who were on the, the team, which was kept secret uh, for quite some time, to put it together physically, uh, to translate it, and of course to try to deduce some meaning out of it. Profiles here on this page, I'm uh, not reproducing all of these, of course. Some of these are familiar if you've read. Uh, Bart Ehrman publishes a lot on the popular seminary or semi-popular level. Uh, Bart teaches at uh, NC State, I believe. This guy down here, uh, the reason I have this page is I do want to draw your attention to Craig Evans. Uh, Craig teaches in Canada, the Acadia Divinity School in Nova Scotia. Uh, again, I, I got to meet him last year. Uh, just a wonderful guy. This is a picture of him. He was on, you know, as I providentially found out, he was on this team and asked him to be uh, a guest on Coast to Coast. And, and their producers thought it was a wonderful idea. And he did a good job. Notice what Craig says. This is an article from a, a newspaper called The Chronicle. It's a Canadian paper right here. Judas is a second century Gnostic text. He said, referring to the Christian sect announced as heretical by the church as early as 180 AD. It has an axe to grind and it grinds it. Okay? He's very honest. Uh, Craig has offered, authored over 50 books, authored or edited, I should say. Uh, one, of the, one of the bigger names in New Testament studies. And Craig is, uh, he, would, he would be comfortable calling himself an evangelical uh, scholar. Very, very well respected in the scholarly community. Let's face it, folks, you're not going to get on this team if you're a hack. Okay, this was a big deal to get selected here. Frequently asked questions. Now, I refer to you uh, to the top one and the last one. You will see this term thrown around, Codex Chaikos. The Codex is an ancient book consisting of folded pages and so on and so forth. It's called that because of this line right here is named after Demat Demaratus Chaikos, father of the Zoric-based antiquities dealer, Frida Nussberger. Now, Nussberger Chaikos, you can, you can get some description on these people. I, I don't know if I want to necessarily, I can't endorse necessarily the website, but there, if you put these names into a website, into a browser with Gospel of Judas, 
you're going to come across you know, some websites that detail uh, fairly explicitly uh, how this thing changed hands. And this would make a good Robert Ludlum novel because you have this thing spent a lot of time in the seedy underworld of the uh, art and archaeology um, acquiring community. Uh, basically those people who like to steal antiquities <laughs> and pass them on. Now this is from a blog on the Gospel of Judas, the unsettling conclusion. The Robinson contribution. Robinson here is James Robinson, the guy who was put in charge of translating the Nag Hammadi Gospels into English, forming that team. And it seems that Robinson has had some role to play in the surfacing of this gospel. Robinson used to be a reformed evangelical Protestant pastor. He is now basically a Gnostic. Uh, I, I don't know him. Uh, I, I know a friend of his uh, who used to be a colleague of his, in fact. And basically what, you, what Evan said of the Gospel of Judas, you can say of James Robinson. He has an ax to grind, and he grinds it. Uh, you can look up his role in this on the web, uh, going to this blog, Ecthesis. The lower page of this is about this fellow Farini in here, who is one of the central figures, it, it, it appears, with how the Gospel of Judas surfaced. Uh, it, it gets kind of bizarre because the, the current state of this is that this codex actually contained four books. The Gospel of Judas was one of them. There are three other books, portions of which are in this in this codex. Um, that means that there's a question to be answered. Does Mr. Farini still retain the missing parts of the codex? If so, how much? There, ha there have been things in the, in the recent past that have appeared on eBay associated with Mr. Farini that some suspect might be part of this codex, <laughs> believe it or not. It's like everything winds up on eBay. Uh, but this, if you're going to follow the Gospel of Judas story, this is a, a figure that you should keep your eye on. And if you go to the New Testament blogs, there are several good ones. They're, they will keep you up to date on it. Uh, the Gospel of Judas, again, the mysterious case of Mr. Bruce Farini and others, is detailing, again, his relationship in this. I'm not going to spend too much time on this at all. Uh, was the Gospel of Judas known to scholars? Well, the answer is yeah. Uh, Irenaeus mentions this. He doesn't quote from the Gospel of Judas. Irenaeus, writing in about 180 AD, mentions that there is this book that some have referred to as the Gospel of Judas. I put this here because this is a, a blog that one of my friends uh, writes about jumping the shark. And I, my illustration here is this quotation right here. This is from Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is a scholar, uh, New Testament studies, and this is the kind of thing that, I, that to me personally is a concern when it comes to the Gospel of Judas. How many of you have read the Gospel of Judas by now? Anybody? Okay. I, I have it up here on the screen. We, we, you know, we can flip through parts of it. I'm not going to just read the whole thing. It's not that long. But they are really making much ado about, I won't say nothing, but next to nothing. And you have this quote by guys like Bart Ehrman. We aren't sure when this gospel was written. The copy in our possession appears to date from the end of the 3rd century, around 280 or so, 250 years after Jesus' death. <clears throat> but that doesn't tell us when the book was originally composed. In the case of the Gospel of Mark, for example, we don't have any surviving copies until after the 3rd century. But Mark, most likely the first of the canonical Gospels to be written, was almost certainly composed by 65 or 70. Do you see what he's just done? He's saying, well, Mark, you know, we don't have copies of Mark until the 300s. And we know that that was written around 65 or 70. Okay, there's our logical construct. Now we'll plug in, well, the Gospel of Judas is around 300. And maybe it works the same way. Maybe that's as old as the Gospel of Mark. 
It's just patently illogical. This is the kind of logic I was illustrating in the last session. And my friend here catches Bart on it. He says, holy non sequitur, Batman. <laughs> One leaves the paragraph thinking that it's possible Judas was written at the same time Ehrman postulates for Mark, 65 or 70. He leaves the comparison to Mark hanging in the last sentence of the paragraph, seemingly implying, though not really, that Judas is similar. A careless reader could easily connect the lingering dots and think, well, if that happened with Mark, why not Judas? Ehrman's quotation comes from this book. If you don't have this, this is the one that the National Geographic Society is selling on their website. It's sort of the hurry up version to get it out before the Da Vinci Code movie. They're actually working on a more substantial book, a more academic uh, book about the Gospel of Judas. But this is nice, light reading. And Ehrman has a chapter in this about you know, the meaning of the Gospel of Judas for Christianity. And he has this quote in there. It just, it's just very poor thinking. And when guys like Bart Ehrman come out with this, this will show up, and it has already showed up, on lots of New Testament blogs basically saying, come on, Bart. You know, you, you just like the limelight too much. And it's drawing some negative publicity for Dr. Ehrman. Another example of a blog is the Gospel of Judas Troubling. This blog is called Ralph the Sacred River. It's kind of an odd, you know, whimsical title. The originator is Edward Cook. Edward Cook is an Aramaic specialist who, I don't, he might still be there at the Hebrew University in Cincinnati. Um, Hebrew, Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, but he writes here about the Gospel of Judas. And you know, as far as, I don't know if Edward Cook has any theological commitments at all. He says, all right, here we go. Sigh, with another Gnostic Gospel alert. How the public, now the publication today of the Gospel of Judas is providing tons of grist for the junk scholarship mill. Again, lots of scholars are just not buying that this is just this earth-shattering revelation. Here's what the New York Times has to say about this and other Gnostic Gospels. And then he has the quote. And if you look at his comment down here, the utter inability of the New York Times to understand the import of this discovery is just amazing. I'm giving you quotations like this again just to make the point that the scholarly community, there are two communities. There's the scholarly community, the people who do this stuff. And they're frankly like, oh, wow, this is cool. This is kind of interesting. But it's not earth shattering. Then there's the group over here, the interested layperson who wants to find out about this, but the sources they use just aren't that great because they're using popular media sources, again, like the New York Times or People Magazine or something like that. I mean, at least they're learning something. But the people who write those articles are not specialists. They're not even close to being specialists. And so they're getting, most of the public are just, is just getting bad information, which is a shame because my view is if people, the average person, wants to know about this, this will get people talking about the New Testament. It'll get people talking about the Bible. And this, this is, in and of itself, is a good thing. Uh, but, boy, I wish they would get better information. And so the scholarly community has just not been kind to the media frenzy. But the, you know, the, the popular audience is like, wow, this is just earth-shattering. Here is the Gospel of Judas. This is from the PDF uh, translation that the National Geographic Society has on their page. You can download this for free. You can't download the book for free, but you can at least get the translation. Uh, your title, your, your editorial team, your copyright notice. Uh, I don't know how much of this I really uh, want to read. There are a few spots that are kind of interesting. Let's just go down here to, by the way, when it says scene, this is not in the text. This is just the way the editors have divided up the material. So down here, this is manuscript material. It says, one day Jesus, he, Jesus, was with his disciples in Judea, and he found them gathered together and seated in pious observance. When he approached his disciples, and there's, you know, he approached his disciples gathered together and seated and offering a prayer of thanksgiving over the bread, he laughed. Jesus does a lot of laughing in the Gospel of Judas for some reason. Uh, the disciple said to him, Master, why are you laughing at our prayer of thanksgiving? We have done what is right. And he answered and said to him, I'm not laughing at you. You are not doing this because of your own will, but because 
It is through this that your God will be praised. It's kind of an odd phrasing. Remember, think like a Gnostic. Think like a Gnostic. Who is their God? The disciples are Jewish. Who is their God? The Demiurge. It's not Jesus God. Jesus is an aeon. He's above the Demiurge. So Jesus is actually very cutting in the Gospel of Judas to all the disciples. It's really very condescending uh, in, in the way it reads. But, you know, you can get it for yourself and read it. They said, Master, you are the son of our God. And Jesus said to them, how do you know me? Truly I say to you, no generation of the people that are among you will know me. Throughout the whole thing, he's sort of flirting with them intellectually and just, oh, you guys don't know squat. You know, you know. I mean, it's, it's just very, it's, it's almost mean in places. It's kind of unusual. Uh, Jesus speaks to Judas privately, knowing that Judas was reflecting upon something that was exalted. Uh, let, let me go back up to this, this thing about Barbello. Um, let's see, Judas said to him, I know who you are. And where you've come from, you are from the immortal realm of Barbalo. And I am not worthy to utter the name of the one who has sent you. Now, I'm going to park here just a second because this is another evidence that Jesus was more than a man from a Gnostic text. Barbello is, is Gnostic lingo for the ultimate god of the Pleroma. It, it mean, it, it's scholar, Gnostic scholars and Coptic scholars think that it comes from a Hebrew word which is be arba el, which means in or with the four el. El was the name of the God of Israel. The four is the tetragrammaton, the divine name, the four letters. And so this is their way of referring to um, you know, the ultimate God. They don't want to call him, in their mind, it's not Yahweh, even though they're using the four letters, because Yahweh is the fool. He's the chaotic, created monster thing from Sophia. They're using a lot of terminology you would, you would be familiar with from your Old Testament. And they're, they, Gnostics like to use it of the ultimate God who is you know, the, the core of the Pleroma. So that's what the reference is there. But he says, you're from the immortal realm of Barbalo. Okay? You're from the Pleroma. You're one of these eons. Judas says, I know who you are. And of course, Jesus, you know, Gives him some cryptic response, but he also gives him some encouraging response later. Let's flip ahead here a little bit. Uh, you have here an interesting dream that the disciples have. Let's go back up here. At the very bottom, the disciples see the temple and discuss it. They have a dream. They said, we have seen a great house with a large altar in it and 12 men. They are the priests, we would say, and a name... And a crowd of people is waiting at that altar until the priest, and then there's a gap, and receive the offerings. But we kept waiting. And Jesus said, what are the priests like? They said, some, and there's a gap, two weeks. Just, the text isn't, doesn't survive. Some sacrifice their own children, others their wives, in praise and humility with each other. Some sleep with men. Some are involved in slaughter. Some commit a multitude of sins and deeds of lawlessness. And the men who stand before the altar invoke your name. And in all the deeds of their deficiency, the sacrifices are brought to completion. After they said this, they were quiet, for they were troubled. Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? Truly I say to you, all the priests who stand before that altar invoke my name. Again I say to you, my name has been written on this blank of the generations of the stars to the human generations. And they have planted trees without fruit in my name in a shameful matter. Jesus said to them, those you have seen receiving the offerings at the altar, that's who you are. Now, I remember Craig saying on the show, and I've since read, this section, and it goes down below here, has a very anti-Semitic feel to it because it's very critical of Jewish offerings and the priesthood. And Jesus goes as far as to say, that's who you guys are. You're Jews. Again, this isn't the kind, of, the kind of flavor you get from one of the New Testament Gospels, but it's very typical of Gnosticism. Because why? Because the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jew, is the Demiurge. He's evil. 
He's the fool. He's Saklas, the blind one. He's the enemy because he doesn't want us to know that we have the spark of divinity in us. So they're very critical of Judaism. You know, Jesus isn't, isn't a normal mortal Jew. He's an aeon that just kind of takes the appearance of a man. So Jesus can slam the Jews all he wants. He's not one of them. Again, this is Gnosticism. One of the things I hope you take away from, if you're just watching the DVD or you're here, don't be fed the line that Gnosticism is just this wonderful, enlightened thing, and boy, wouldn't we all be blessed if everybody was a Gnostic and all this kind of thing. And I'm not saying, you know, Gnosticism's like any other faith. You can have people in it that just take it to the nth degree and, and, and use it abusively. Um, you know, a lot of Gnostics aren't going to do that. But what I encourage you to do is read the literature. It will tell you very clearly that this is not just option B or plan B or a little pretty much like Orthodox Christianity. It's not. There are significant differences. This is not just the flip side of a single coin. There are fundamental differences between Gnosticism and what we think of as, as Christianity. Um, it, you know, it grew out of Christianity, became an, a, an oppositional thing when it took on the form of a movement. Uh, there were reasons why the church fathers were troubled. I mean, how can you, how can you claim you know, to, to be a follower of Christ and say these you know, things like, this is just the Gospel of Judas, this is all through the Gnostic stuff. How can you say these things about God's people? This is where the church came from. Judas recounts a vision. Jesus responds. Let's go down to um, Judas asks about his own fate. Judas said, Master, could it be that my seed is under the control of the rulers? The seed in Gnostic thinking is the soul, by the way, you know, his internal self. The rulers are the archons. The, the, divine, the watchers, I guess we would say in, in, in my lingo, Enoch lingo. Jesus answered and said to him, Come, that I, and then there's lines missing, but that you will grieve much when you will see the kingdom in all its generation. When he heard this, Judas said to him, What good is it that I have received it? For you have set me apart for that generation. Jesus answered and said, You will become the 13th. It's a reference to him being set aside from the apostolic 12. You will become the 13th and you will be cursed by the other generations and you will, you will come to rule over them. In the last days they will curse your ascent to the holy generation. Generation here means the generation of the Pleroma. The Pleroma, the eons that were produced from the ultimate divine force. Jesus is saying, those other guys are not going to get to that level, but you will. It's very pro-Judas. It's the gospel of Judas. You will. You understand all these mysteries. Let's go to the last section here, the one that everybody's talking about in the, uh, in the media. Jesus speaks of those who are baptized in Judas' betrayal. Judas said to Jesus, Look, what will those who have been baptized in your name do? And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, this baptism, gap, my name, another gap, about nine lines missing, Truly I say to you, Judas, those who offer sacrifice to Sakalas, Gap, God, everything that is evil, and again, he's, it's just missing, it's not coherent. But then he says, but you will exceed all of them. You know, those who sacrifice to Sakalas are, of course, the twelve, the Jews there. You will sacrifice the man that clothes me. Again, in Gnostic theology, Jesus and the Christos, they're, they're different eons, but the eon that becomes known as Jesus, there's the cosmic real Jesus up here who takes upon the appearance of a man. He's not incarnated. He's not really human. Okay? He either, Gnostic theology varies from text to text. It's not consistent. He either appears as a man or he inhabits just some guy. But he's saying, look, Judas, you're going to hand over the man you know, who clothes me. I'm not really going to die because I'm an eon. I'm eternal. It's not going to happen to me. This is why Jesus and other Gnostic texts is just watching the crucifixion, kind of chuckling. Oh, boy, they, they think they got me, but they don't. 
Whereas Christianity, you know, said this was a real man and he really died. The Gnostic texts also have Jesus rising from the dead too. It's completely contrary to what Lawrence Gardner and Michael Bajan, some of these other guys have. But again, they're referring to, they're not referring really necessarily to the man that was inhabited as they are to the, the survival, as it were, of the cosmic Jesus who then appears to them again in human form. This is again a fundamental distinction between Orthodox Christianity and Gnosticism. Uh, this is why I said earlier, if anything, Gnostics do not downplay the divinity of Jesus, they downplay the humanity. And the Da Vinci Code has it exactly reversed. You know, it's just a fundamental error with understanding Gnosticism. But this is why you have this. And of course, you know, Jesus is saying, look, you know, you're going to do this. This is your destiny. You know, it, it's going to make you, you know, it's going to vault you to the next level, you know, the, the level, the generation of the eons. And then, of course, it ends where Judas just goes out and, and hands him over. Now, in the New Testament, it's, it's very clear. In the, in the book of Acts, we, we learn, specifically in Peter's sermon, that all of these things that happened to Jesus were the foreordained counsel of God. That's not new. The Gospel of Judas hints at that, that this was foreordained. You know, that's nothing new with the New Testament. What's new, what's different about the Gospel of Judas is that Judas is nowhere called a traitor. Judas is not viewed negatively. Judas was a hero to certain Gnostic groups. Why? Why would Judas be a hero? He's fulfilling the will of God in that the Savior is going to be crucified and, and Gnostics still believe Jesus is the key to salvation. But the real enemy is who? It's the God who sent him to the cross. Okay, it's, it's this evil demiurge. Right? It's just something you have to... I realize Gnosticism at this level, in, in, these, in this area, how they view God as the ultimate and then the God of the Old Testament being two totally different things. If you're not used to reading Gnostic sources, it's kind of mind-bending. But when you approach the Gospel of Judas or one of these Gnostic texts, you have, to keep, you have to keep the cosmology in mind, which is why we started with that. Here is the quote from Athanasius, or excuse me, from Irenaeus. Some declare that Cain derived his being from the power above and acknowledge that Esau, Korah, the Sodomites, and all such persons are related to themselves. They declare that Judas the traitor was thoroughly acquainted with these things and that he alone, knowing the truth as no others did, accomplished the mystery of the betrayal. By him all things, both earthly and heavenly, were thus thrown into confusion. They produce a fictional history of this kind, which they style the Gospel of Judas. This is 180 AD. Irenaeus is referring to this Gospel that now has been, been discovered and, and translated. Lastly, here's our, our anti-hero, or... Michael Bajant, which if there's anybody with an axe to grind, I think it's this fellow right here. I think he launched himself into his lawsuit of Dan Brown for purely publicity. I, I, I don't think he had a prayer, and I think he knew it, of, of winning the case, because he wanted to promote his new book called The Jesus Papers, which has now been released, exposing the greatest cover-up in history for a very reasonable 37.95. And I love this blog or this 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 uh, story. The dog ate my Jesus papers. Bajant claimed in advance publicity that he had uncovered a document written by Jesus in the year 45 A.D. that proves he was alive. Okay. Well, if you actually get the book, if you're foolish enough to pay the 37.95, and you start reading it. This is what you find. Pretty soon, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the reader realizes that there probably won't be any Jesus documents, that this book is really a private credo, an intimate declaration of belief dressed up to be the religious bombshell of the millennium. But then the long-anticipated appearance of the documents comes, or does it, near the end. Bajant meets with an unidentified antiquities dealer. This is kind of a formula for a movie who shows him two pieces of parchment. Each was about 18 inches long and 9 inches high. These were the letters from Jesus to the Sanhedrin. They existed. I was silent as I fully enjoyed the moment. Of course, 
He tells you later that he can't read Aramaic or Greek or Coptic. So it turns out that he has an antiquities dealer that he can't identify that tells him what's in these things that he never actually produces. That's the big bombshell of the millennium. I wished above all that I might have a familiarity with the ancient languages. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> that would help. Comes in handy. It's like holding a treasure chest but not having the key to open it. You know, and the, the final line is pretty much where it's at. The writer of the story says, this is just insulting. You know, to have all this build up, to throw yourself in court, to basically sell books, and you come up and you produce nothing. You could have at least photocopied or taken a picture of these manuscripts. He's never going to do that. They probably don't even exist. Okay? He wants to make money off the conspiratorial logic. What a real scholar and a real researcher would do is you go to somebody like the National Geographic Society with deep pockets, you pony up for the manuscripts, and then you turn them over for scholarly study. You don't meet in a smoke-filled room and then tell us that you saw two scraps that were 9 by 18 and you couldn't read them. I mean, give us a break. But this is where he's at. You know, and I, I think that it's just basically a fiasco. Now, you know, having said that, the Gospel of Judas is valuable. I mean, you can learn things about it. It's a typical Gnostic text. We can at least learn something about the Gnostics. It's not surprising they held a positive view of Judas. We already knew that from Irenaeus. So, you know, where does that leave us? It, it, it leaves us really not knowing too much more than what we knew before it was discovered. And for Elaine Pagels to put this quote on the, the cover of this book, the discovery of the Gospel of Judas is astonishing. My question would be to Elaine, why? You act as if we've never discovered a manuscript before. We have like several hundred, or actually thousands of manuscripts, if we count fragmentary things. What's so astonishing about discovering a manuscript? What's so astonishing about discovering a manuscript that somebody in church history already told us existed? What's so astonishing about the contents of the manuscript being consistent with stuff we already knew about the Gnostic sect, specifically the Sethians? and their high view of Judas. Where's the revelation? But again, that just doesn't make for good copy. And uh, you know, to me, that's, that's pretty much where some of these people are at. Any questions? Yes, Guy. In a second, just for DVD, define pseudepigrapha. But my question is, is this Gospel of Judas, does it claim to be written in the first person? Or is Judas really the, asking all the questions, gets the airtime, main character? Yeah, it's, it's fine to as soon Yeah, it's 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 not it's not first person. You know, it it is what it what it is. Uh, third person, it's about Judas. It, it doesn't claim to have been written firsthand by him. Yeah, yeah, it end, You never. Yeah, it, it it doesn't. What we have of it ends. You know, so whether this guy has more pages to it, if it goes in to describe the crucifixion or not, I mean, we, we don't know. You know, there's, there's lots of Gnostic texts that describe the crucifixion and a resurrection. Um, so it, it's probably going to just be consistent with the rest of the Gnostic material if there is anything, you know, left. I mean, who knows? That could be the end, though, you know, for, all, for all we know. Uh, Pseudepigrapha... Pseudepigrapha as a term refers to Jewish and in some cases, depending on the date, uh, Christian books or Jewish books that Christians went in and, and edited later that were never considered part of the canon. Okay? They were never considered by Jews to be part of the Old Testament books. They were never considered by Christians to be part of the New Testament. They get their term... The term, contrary to what you'll see in some circles, does not mean false writings. The, the, it refers to the fact that the document claims to have been written by or about, usually about, a famous figure from the Old or New Testament. And so 
what is the pseudo the pseudopigraph is the attribution of authorship that is not true. It's it's just it's falsely attributed authorship, not not that the contents are just bad and, and awful or anything like that. So that that's where that's where the the description comes from. Another question? Yeah. Do you know how much uh, National Geographic paid for, for those documents? You know, I I I can I can only you know tell you what I've what I've seen. They haven't been terribly forthright. Um, I know that the asking price earlier was two to three million, but that was before National Geographic stepped in. Um, that's the only actual figure I've seen, so I have to guess it would probably be that in that range. Uh, they've been they've been a little tight-lipped about what they actually paid for it, and the reason is pretty obvious. And you know, scholars, this is a tough area because on the one hand. If it's kind of like a hostage situation. If you pay the price, it encourages people in the underground art and antiquities world to bring more things out and essentially hold the scholarly community hostage all over again. So if you meet the demand, then you're kind of hooked. And it's going to encourage more of the same behavior. The problem is, if you don't meet the demand, Scholars want to see this stuff. And frankly, even more than wanting to see it, they're concerned that, that this kind of material is just mishandled and it'll be destroyed and, and it'll be lost forever. And so there is a propensity. I'm not going to state a position here because frankly, I, I haven't thought too deeply about it. I, I don't know what, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, you know, I would be inclined to want something preserved, but you know, I, I, am, I am concerned that it's just going to create a kind of hostage situation. This, hap this is still happening with the Dead Sea Scrolls, believe it or not. There are con consistent rumors that there are still Dead Sea Scrolls out there because when they were originally discovered, <laughs> people aren't dumb. When, when they knew they could get money for them, they would take a scroll and slice pieces out of it because they know they can sell it more than once. You know, just, you, know, you can call it greed. You could also call it, I guess, good business sense, you know, on, you know from a black market perspective. But um, it just, it, it encouraged that kind of behavior. And so that's the, that's the pickle you get yourself into. Didn't, didn't, I, didn't I hear that one of, I read somewhere a short, thing about the, this particular manuscript and that some of the people involved in obtaining it have a history yeah. of uh, the kind of dealings you're talking about that are a lot that are very questioned. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, if you go if you go to the blogs, the, the names of those people will be uh, given. <laughs> there there's one blog it's not a blog, it, it's actually a website of a guy I know I have his name in the file there. It's not coming to, to mind right away. If you put Gospel of, of Judas into a browser, and uh, I, could, I could send you the specific address. There, there is a guy on the web that has a kind of a cheesy website. It looks like you know a 10-year-old put it together. But the guy's actually in the underground art world community, and he loves to make fun of, of the people who are doing these kinds of things because he, he doesn't like the corruption in the underground art community. And he'll name names and, and call them, he'll call them names too, and just poke fun at them constantly. Uh, and he has a lot of, of uh, the Gospel of Judas stuff on his site, even before National Geographic uh, ponied up, uh, whatever they did pony up. This guy was a friend of a guy named Charles Hedrick, who was a Coptic scholar who years ago got to see part of the Gospel of Judas and wrote out a very quick hand-drawn transcription and translation. And the guy has it on his website. You know, so he's saying, I'm a friend of Hedrick, and here's the proof, and you know, here are the pictures that he took, and here's his translation. In other words, he, he's doing that to say that I'm not making it up. I know what I'm talking about here. I know these people. And he has lots of real kind of comical, but also sort of digs 
at, at some of these people involved because they were extorting others. They were, you know, trying to, you know, I, I won't call it thievery because, you know, they, they would get their hands on it and, and it, it would become a tool for extortion. But see, then you're, then you're caught in the middle because how do I know what I, if I'm a buyer, how do I know what I'm buying isn't stolen property from somebody else? And even part of it, they could, just, they could be withholding parts and I don't really get what I think I'm getting because the people are unscrupulous. But it, it, it's, it's kind of a funny site. If you, you email Guy or, or, or through, through Guy you get to me, I'll, I'll send you the site. It's, it's, in, it's interesting. And the, and the blogs will have it too. The blogs know the site as well. If you go up to the New Testament blogs, you know, like uh, th this one I had here in the, in the presentation, or Paleo Judaica is a blog that's really devoted to antiquities and biblical studies. And New Testament Gateway, Mark Goodacre, who is a professor at Duke now, he has a, a pretty popular blog. But you can keep up with the Gospel of Judas saga um, by just keeping track of the blogs a little bit. Earlier you said uh, the Gnostics depict Judas as a good guy. And I know why you said that. Is there, and, and even in like the, the old movie Jesus Christ Superstar, he's shown in angelic attire and in heaven at the end of it. Mm -hmm. What merit would you give or what has the Christian academic community given to the idea that Judas really was an okay guy fulfilling the purposes of God. Because you could say the same about Hitler only in a Romans 8.28 way, but is there anything about Judas that actually would elevate him beyond well, Scott, Scholars are going to say what, what the, the data in the primary sources allow them to say, which is a nice... Well, they're, they're going to say, well... Scholars will, if they're going to try to maintain some sort of religious neutrality or impression of neutrality, they're going to say, well, the New Testament characterizes Judas as a villain. The Gospel of Judas does not. Gnosticism you know, does not. And that's pretty much where it's at. They won't take a position. But they, they will recognize that in terms of antiquity, the New Testament stuff is older and more closely related chronologically to the events that they describe. But, you know, a lot of scholars will just, they'll just leave it at that. You know, the, the other side of that is there, there, is, there is no scholar, though, who would, in, you know, even people like Pagels, you know, who are, who are just saying things basically to get media buzz. Uh, even she's not going to say anything as, as silly and ridiculous as this is, you know, pardon the pun, this is the gospel truth. And Judas really was a good guy. I mean, she's she's going to stick with you know with with the data. This is what the Gnostics believed, and and that's what it is. What it is. You know, nobody's going to come out and and, and favor a, a good guy Judas as being you know historically valid because in their minds, frankly, they, they they can't tell. They they will admit that the New Testament stuff has priority. That it's chronologically preceding. Um, that that nobody else thought this way except for this. This is even a subsect of Gnosticism, the Sethians. Um, so, so nobody's going to say that this was a dominant view held by anybody. Are we done? Just on the topic of Judas himself, not so much the Gnostic gospel of, um, have you ever seen a commentary? Suggesting it says um, that one of the twelve was a devil. Chris Ward, if you ever seen on the side one, but I think it's Matthew uh, Henry's commentary. Have you seen anything or have any belief that would indicate that Judas himself actually was a watcher, i.e., a non-human? No, no, I yeah, I've I've never seen that. I don't I don't believe that. Um, you know. Everything seems to indicate he's just he's just one of the guys, because other 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 texts will say that Satan entered into him, so that that would rule against the idea that that Judas himself is some sort of uh, non-human entity. Why why would Satan have to enter into a into a demon? Does that make any sense? Does uh, but since you mentioned that, since you already said that Gnosticism 
the serpent is the good guy. The serpent is the hero in the story. Yeah. In the Gnostic view, the fact that Satan entered his, into Judas props him up as an all the more the right. hero, right? Right. He's because empowered. He's basically the he's empowered. He's he's enlightened. Well, from from a from an Orthodox Christian perspective, he would be un antichrist. Um, you know, just someone who in that sense, who would, who would be oppositional. But I, I actually don't think that that's really a, a good way to look at Judas because, you know, Peter's sermon and, and other, there are other suggestions that, that Judas, what he, what, it, it's the old, how can I be morally culpable if God engineered circumstances to do X, Y, or Z? And the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the, the New Testament affirms both ideas, that God doesn't necessarily cause or control behavior, but circumstances can be uh, arranged to take advantage of human propensities or whatnot, and God has the ability to, to take certain circumstances and steer them toward an end that he has ordained, you know, is necessary and needs to happen. Um, yeah, yeah, the hardening of, the, of Pharaoh's heart is the same thing. Was it Pharaoh who hardened his heart, or was it God? The scriptures say it was both. Um, you know, it's, it's the old sovereignty, free will thing. And, you know, you could probably, if you stacked all the books that have been written on that, you know, you're, you're looking at skyscraper territory. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 not a, it's not a new issue. I, I, you know, I, I just tend to believe that if you, if you don't have God being in charge of the crucifixion, you know, in, in, in some sense, then somebody else had to be in charge. And who might that be? You know, it, it doesn't cohere in either Old Testament or New Testament biblical theology. Uh, you, you can't have a, a competing, equally powerful uh, being, even with divine plurality in the Old Testament, because the claim is that Yahweh created all the other ones. So by definition, they are derivative and inferior. Uh, what we think of as dualism is not very defensible uh, in either the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. So you have to have a sovereign God who is, you know, in, in charge, so to speak. Uh, the real question is, how is he in charge? Does he cause people to do things? Is he behind people saying, sin, sin, you know, let me help you a little bit? Or <clears throat> has he... Has he foreseen what humans were, are going to do naturally because of the effect of the fall and has engineered circumstances to a predetermined end? Does he predestinate at the beginning or at the end? That's another question. There's all sorts of questions you know, when you get into this. and it, the, the, the answers don't fit into a good sound bite. No. <laughs> no, just thank everybody who came for coming and those who get the DVD, hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for listening. I enjoy doing it. Just, you know, go out and, and demand, demand the data. Demand uh, that, that people who are telling you something show you where they got it so that you can go check it yourselves and do it. You know, invest some time into it. All right. Thank you once again for watching uh, DaVinciCoda.com. And uh, as it says on the site, I don't know if you were on the website before you got this DVD, uh, Mike is not asking this, I'm not asking it, and Mike uh, may be shy that I would bring it up, but if you want to ever show this DVD publicly in churches, home group settings, anything like that beyond the original purchaser or user, I'm asking, Mike is not, but I'm asking that you mail some type of gift or offering to Mike Kaiser, and I have his personal mailing address listed on website. The worker is worthy. It's not only that he spent two or three months preparing these lectures for you. Um, he spent 20 years going to school um, in order to get the knowledge that would allow him to prepare something like this in two or three months. So, and if you make copies of this as well, uh, I will authorize you to make a copy, or especially a backup, but if you want to make a lot of them, an offering of some type is, is also appropriate also to the workers in so thank you very much. My name is Guy Malone. Go to davincicoda.com and you can contact Mike directly through his website, michaelsheiser.com or michaelsheiser at yahoo.com. And he'll be glad to answer further questions on this. He makes himself, uh, more so than many pastors or scholars, and so much so very accessible to those with honest questions. As long as you're not grinding an ax 
and as long as you're willing to deal with data and you honestly want to know his truth or his answers in your quest for the truth, Mike is very uh, long-suffering and forbearing with you. So feel free to contact Michael S. Heiser at yahoo.com with more questions on this topic. Thanks. Thank you,